So there were countless nights where Tammy and I would just be lying in bed and we would be looking at one another and sometimes we didn't even have to say words because we knew we were right in the midst of transition when it came to these bunk beds. We were right in the middle of it. All the laughing and the giggling and the screaming and the crying and the fighting and the arguing and the climbing and the sleeplessness. We're right in the middle of it. And we'd look at one another and say, are we doing this thing right? Surely there's a better way to do this. And I can remember on one particular night having the conversation. Are we going to stick with this? Or should we just go back to the way it was? Because the way it was seemed a lot easier. And that's exactly the question that life transitions ask of us, isn't it? Are you going to stick with it? Or are you going to turn and run? Are you going to run away? Or are you going to stay present and do the hard work? That's what life transitions ask of us. And let's just be clear from the beginning uh, about transitions. Transitions aren't necessarily changes. Changes come and go. Changes happen in life, and when they do, you rarely have a say in the change. But transition is different, because transition is about moving from one point to another, and you get a say in that. Transition is about moving to the next chapter in the story, and you actually get a say in that. And there's all sorts of life transitions that can come along, right? Sam mentioned a few of them during her children's time. There's a new career, or the loss of a career, There's graduating from high school or college or moving out or becoming empty nesters. There's retirement, buying a home, losing a home, new relationships, old relationships, divorce, the new life found in sobriety, moving a parent into a nursing home facility or becoming a parent for the first time. There are all kinds of life transitions. So rather than me try to name all of them for you, here's what we'll do. You'll see a number on the screen. We want to hear from you. Text your transitions at any point during this sermon. And here's the rules. Just use a word or a couple of words or a short phrase. Please don't go and give all the backstory to this transition because Ken may not like texting that on the screen. But we want to know. Let's know what we all are going through, right? If you're going through a job promotion and it's really great for you, cool. Text it. Let's get it on the screen so we can all celebrate it. If you're going through something really hard, a major loss in your life, text it. Let's get it on the screen. And you say, oh, why would I do that? Why would I air my stuff like that? Because when you do, it's a really simple way for you to say to others in this space, You are not alone. I've been there. I too know what that feels like. You're not alone. We're in it together. So text it and the tech team will put up your text periodically throughout this sermon. So first a couple of observations about transitions, then a couple of things that I think get in the way of transitions. Observations first. Transitions always present us this blinking line, right? Think of your computer. When you open up your computer and you open up pages or Word or a new email to draft, there's that blinking line, isn't there? And it just kind of stares at you. And it says the same thing every time. There is the possibility that something new is going to be created here. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to run or are you going to stay present? Second observation about transitions. When we're going through life transitions, they always have a way of asking us the hardest, most uncomfortable question. And the question is, who are you? Who are you? And so I want to look at a story this morning from the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament The first book of the Bible, Genesis, about a man wrestling with God and being asked precisely that question, who are you? Genesis chapter 32, 
Verse 22, Jacob got up during the night, took his two wives, his two servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River shallow water. He took them and everything that belonged to him and he helped them cross the river. But Jacob stayed apart by himself and a man wrestled with him until dawn broke. When the man saw that he couldn't defeat Jacob, he grabbed Jacob's thigh and tore a muscle in Jacob's thigh as he wrestled with him. The man said, let me go because the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. He said to Jacob, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Now I want to stop there for a moment. Because this question that God asks is loaded with all sorts of history. When we first meet Jacob earlier in the story in chapter 27 of Genesis, Jacob is trying to disguise his father into thinking that he's actually his older brother Esau. His father, Isaac, is on his deathbed. He's dying, and at this point in his life, he has lost his eyesight. Now, it was their tradition in that time and in that day for the father to give the blessing to the eldest son. And essentially what that means is the father would say to the oldest son, all I have is yours. All of it. All I have is yours. So Jacob, being the younger brother, any younger brothers in the room? Yeah, me too. Jacob wanted the blessing. So he walks into his room, disguises himself. Surely he disguises his voice. And he says, Daddy, I am here for my blessing. And Isaac says, Who are you? Daddy, it is me, your eldest son, Esau. I am here for my blessing. And Isaac senses that something isn't quite right. And so he asks again, Yes, but who are you? It is me, Father, your eldest son, Esau, and I'm here for the blessing. And it works. He deceives his father, gets the blessing, and he's on the run because he knows what he did. You know what Jacob's problem in life was throughout his life? He was trying to be someone else. And now he's on the run, and he encounters this man. In the text, we can assume that this man is the God figure in the story. And they begin to wrestle. And God asks Jacob, what's your name? And we have to understand in the ancient Near East, your name told everything. It was your character, your history, your identity, your story. Your name told everything about you. So when he says, what's your name? What Jacob is really being asked here is something much deeper. Who are you? Who are you? How much of our pain in life comes from not knowing who we are? Not knowing who we are. This always gets in the way of transition. Always. Rob Bell is one of my favorite authors, and he just came out with a new book. In fact, he released it just a couple of weeks ago. It's called How to Be Here, and I highly recommend it. In the middle of the book, he has these two subheadings. The first one is called, Who You Aren't Isn't Interesting. And then you drop down a couple of paragraphs, and then it's, Who They Are Isn't Interesting Either. And this makes sense, doesn't it? Because who you aren't, the things you don't have, the places you haven't been, the college you didn't get into, the degree you don't have, These things simply aren't interesting. They're not. You know, I was meeting with a friend for coffee just a few months ago. And I was talking to this friend about the transitions that we're going through here at St. Luke's. And I was describing to him some of the anxieties that it has produced, some of the questions it has raised within me, some of the butterflies that come with it. By the way, if you're going through a new thing in life, 
and you have butterflies, good. Good. This is normal. This is what it means to be human. Welcome those butterflies in. It is God's way of reminding you that you are still alive and breathing. You're awake and aware, and these things actually matter. Welcome them. So I'm talking to my friend, and I said, you know, I don't have this gift, and I don't have this talent, and I don't have experience in this area, and I don't have experience in this area. And he says, whoa, 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 whoa. He said, do you see what you're doing here? I said, uh-uh, what? He said, you just spent the last 10 minutes telling me all the things you don't have. In other words, who you aren't isn't interesting. He said, that's a bad place to start. Let's start with the things you have. Let's start with who you are. And so he literally had me get out a pen and paper, and he said, I want you to make a list of all the things you have. Make a list of who you are, all the things you have, the gifts, the talents, the things that God has given you. And he said, don't play the humility card here. Just write them all down. If you're at a point in your life where you're telling yourself who you aren't, get out a piece of paper and a pen and remind yourself who you are because it's powerful. Who they are isn't interesting either. It's amazing because in that same conversation, just a few minutes later, I started telling my friend, well, you know, they have this gift. And this pastor over here, he's done this, and she's done that, and they've... Man, it is so tempting to endlessly compare ourselves to other people, isn't it? There's this great story in the Gospels. It's right after Jesus' resurrection. And Jesus appears to his disciples, and he's walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And he says, uh, he, he encounters his disciples. He's sitting with them, eating a meal. And he says to Peter, to one of his disciples, he says, Peter, I want you to follow me. And Peter his immediate response, he looks behind him and says, yes, Lord, but what about him? And Jesus essentially says to Peter, Peter, what about him? What does this have to do with you? I just invited you to follow me. It's not about him. But we can all relate to Peter, can't we? I mean, how tempting it is. Say, what about him? What about her? What about them? And do you ever get the sense that God is coming along and saying, wait a minute, it's not about him. It's not about her. It's not about them. It's about your journey, your path, your transition. God is always inviting us to live into our true self. And yet we start with all the wrong questions. What about him? What about her? What about them? And it's simply not interesting. I think it's appropriate to just lift these things up. God, we lift all these things up to you and trust that you are somewhere with us, somewhere with us in the process of heart attacks, of becoming grandparents, divorce, new puppies. You're in the midst of all of it. And we can all relate to Jacob. All the times we've run away from life. All the times we try to take on identities that aren't ours. All the times we've been stuck in a rut. And you know what the voice of the rut says, don't you? The voice of the rut comes along, that voice in your head, and says, come on. You know things aren't ever going to really change. You know tomorrow is going to be the same as it was today. Come on. You know this. Oh, come on. You think you can just leave that addiction behind? Come on. It's going to win. Oh, you think you can actually just go into the gym and start eating different, differently and you're actually going to get healthy and drop the weight? Oh, come on. That'll only last for a couple days, a few weeks at best. Come on. You can't really stick with this. Or how about when things actually start to go well in your life? You find your mojo, you step into your rhythm, and that voice in your head, it starts coming back. 
Oh, come on. Look at you. You don't even deserve this. Look at the things you've done. Look at the places you've come from. You don't deserve this. The voice in your head that tells you those things, it is never a helpful voice. It always gets in the way of transition, doesn't it? You see, the struggle of Jacob is the struggle of all of us. Because we're all being asked that deeper question, who are you? Who are you? And one final word on transition. Own your story and stop beating yourself up. You see, when he responds, I am Jacob, it is like he is finally ready to own all his stuff. All of it, the mistakes he's made, the running, the lying, the new identities, he is owning it. And it's like God says, good, because you and me, we've got some work to do. And by the way, you're not this thing anymore. You're this new thing. Check it out. Here's how the story ends. He said to Jacob, what's your name? He said, Jacob. Then he said, your name won't be Jacob any longer, but Israel. Because you struggled with God and with men and won. Jacob also asked and said, tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask my name? And he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named that place Peniel. Because I've seen God face to face and my life has been saved. You and I, we have pasts. We've made mistakes. We've tried to live into identities that aren't ours. We've tried to be everything that we're not. And you know, we don't have to gloat in these things. We don't have to be proud of them. But we must own them. We must own them. I dig it. We must own all of it, all of it. Because owning it, it helps us move forward. It's what it means to move forward. Owning it is what it means to say no to guilt and shame. Guilt and shame can no longer be the storyteller. Owning it is what we do when we stand up tall and we say, God, we are ready. I am ready for the new thing that's happening. And you don't know what you're doing? Cool. You lay in bed at night, look at your partner and say, what in the heck are we doing? Are we doing it right? Is there a better way to do this? I don't get it. Good. Own it. Own it. Voice it. Put words to it. Because the story, the script, it hasn't been written for tomorrow. You actually get to do that. The line is blinking. The screen is blank. You get to create that. Own it. As we move into our time of communion, and Reverend Janet comes forward, I want to invite you all to do something brave with me. If you're going through a transition in life, whether it's something really small or really big or something in between, if you're willing and able, would you just stand where you are? I'm not going to ask you to do anything special or say anything. Just stand. Feel free to look around and look at your neighbor. Wow. Give them that awkward head nod that you acknowledge them. <laughs> you see, the invitation from God is always to live into your true self, to be the one God created. The invitation is always new life. And the great reminder is, you are not alone. And your transitions, no matter how big, how small, how in between, you are not alone. 